Hi there, and welcome to another lecture on the Epic of Gilgamesh. I'm Dr. Christian Lehman, and today we'll be talking about tablets six, seven, and eight. As a brief reminder, we are picking up after the death of Humbaba and the kind of consequences of that will be what we explore today. So we have been looking at those issues of technology and immediately we pick up with the bodies actually of Gilgamesh and Enkidu still being covered in the gore from that previous encounter. Before we get there though, I wanna tell you briefly um, the overarching theme that we're going to be looking at uh, today is the ambiguity of civilization. What is the, this poem saying about civilization? Is it, as I write here, is living in civilization worth it if we know we are going to die? Or what kind of parameters does civilization create in order to say awareness of death is okay? Because one of the things that does seem to set us apart is um, the awareness of death and kind of the preparations for that. And this is what we'll be seeing happen over the course of these tablets. Um, so tablet six opens with the kind of um, really stunning moment of the bull of heaven. And this here is a image that got quite a lot of popularity over on Twitter, where it set up the encounter in this way. Uh, Ishtar looked up at Gilgamesh's handsome pride. Come to me, she whispered, come to me and be my groom. Let me taste all parts of you, treat you as husband, be treated as wife. And as a gift, I have give to you one regal coach of gold and blue with wheels of yellow and all so new that I would flatter all your might. With the sight of demons driven off by my own God, by my own, feed by my own man. Come to my home, most sweetly scented of all places, where holy faces wash your feet with tears as do the priests and priestesses of gods like Anu all mighty hands of kings and queens. So you see there, um, she's obviously flirting with him and he responds with that uh, ellipsis. It's not just that one, however. Um, Twitter is, the bull of heaven comes up every once in a while. For instance, just earlier today, Dr. David Wright at Arnold Wurm Quaikano was tweeting about um, the bull of heaven in Gilgamesh is clearly the inspiration for uh, all video game bosses. And then what I just showed you came from this tweet here. Patreon request highbrow FGO content of Gilgamesh rejecting Ishtar according to the Iliad of Epic. A legendary example of a thought patrolled so hard she unleashed the bull of heaven eventually leading to the death of Enkidu. And we look at that. So now let's look back at um, Andrew George's translation here. He washed his matted hair. He cleaned his equipment. He shook down his hair down his back. Casting aside his dirty gear, he clad himself in a clean wrap in clean wrapped cloaks around him tied with a sash. Then did Gilgamesh put on a crown. So here at this moment, um, what we see him doing is he is re-entering society, right? He's doing this kind of ritual bath, this ritual bathing in order to be ready to um, come back into the social world. The last element is that crown, right? These are not things that he had out in the wilderness because he's re-entered, reintegrating. As a result of this though, on the beauty of Gilgamesh, Lady Ishtar looked with longing. Come Gilgamesh, be you my bridegroom, grant me your fruits, oh grant me, be you my husband and I your wife, right? So she's sliding into his DMs. Let me harness you a chariot of lapis lazuli and gold. Its wheels shall be gold and its horns shall be amber. There, of course, we have this bit of tech, right? We have actually vehicular technology. As you enter our house, doorway and footstool shall kiss your feet. Oh, I missed driving lions and a team and mules of great sizes. Enter our house amidst the sweet scent of cedar. So here we have architectural, architectural tech. And then that, uh, king's courtiers and nobles shall kneel before you, produce a mountain and 
lowland they shall bring to you as tribute. So then we have um, economic tech. But then we jump backwards, right? Your goats shall bear triplets, your ewes shall bear twins, your donkey, when laden, shall outpace any mule, your horse shall gallop at any chariot in glory, no ox shall match yours at the oak. And so the last thing we have is uh, agricultural tech. So this whole idea of society starts here and then goes to all these different branches with these promises. So essentially what she's saying is, hey, I'll make you like the best of like the current system that we have put in place. A small bit of poignancy for those of us that care about Humbaba is saying, hey, your house is going to forever smell like those woods where you killed Humbaba. He though responds by being like picking up on these themes of tech promises and saying, no, 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 no. I know what happens. I've read a myth. This is the problem, right? <laughs> When you're in a world of mythology, the people often know the myths that are being told. So here's how he responds. Who, this is Gilgamesh talking. Who is there would take you in marriage? You are a frost that congeals no ice. You are a louvredor that stays not, that so stays means here stops, that stays not breeze nor drought. You are a palace that massacres warriors an elephant with its hoods, a bitumen that shades the hands of its bearer, a water skin that cuts the hands of its bearer, limestone that weakens a wall of ashlar, a battering ram that destroys the walls of the enemy, a shoe that bites the foot of the owner. What bridegroom of yours did endure forever? What brave warrior of yours went up to heaven? So, What's going on here? Well, let's start with the top, right? So basically, saying, you're broke. Like, you are broken technology. You are a refrigerator that doesn't work right. You're a frost that congeals no ice, right? You're a door that doesn't stay closed. It just swings in the breeze. So you're broken architecture. You're a palace, you're a building that uh, massacres warriors. What's the palace supposed to do? It protects, but it's not. It's like it reverses. It's coming back on its makers. And it's, it's harder to understand these next few lines, which are, um, are broken, but water skin that cuts the hands of its bear. Well, the water skin is supposed to keep things inside. Your skin is a big old water sack. And here it's letting blood out because it cuts it. It's a really complicated image, really exciting, fascinating image. Similarly, a limestone that weakens a wall of ashlar. Ashlar, these huge stones building up these walls. And remember, Uruk is this palace of walls. Gilgamesh loves a wall. And I was like, whoa, you're going to weaken my wall. And then we kind of narrow things down. You're a battering wall that destroys a battering under the walls of the enemy. That one's harder to talk about and figure out, um, but because it doesn't really seem to reverse back. Um, you are a shoe that bites the foot of its owner, right? So uh, like, you make me feel like I have permanently stubbed toes and I get cranky. Uh, what, and then uh, you go on, and so you're, you're used. She gets super pissed. Um, but I wanna compare this really quickly to an earlier insult from Humbaba, where Humbaba insulted Enkidu, saying, you spawn of a fish, you knew no father, hatchling of terrapin and turtles, suckled no mother's milk, and you are a warlike stranger, right? These were all nature insults about procreation and parentage. So we have two different types of insulting, right? We have nature insults here with Enkidu and tech insults here with Gil. So he then goes on to list some mythology and he uh, discusses Ishtar's lovers. Come, let me tell you the tale of your lovers. Uh, da -da -da, his arm, Demudzi, the lover of your youth. And with each of these lovers, they seem to kind of transform. Um, and she's not limited to humans or humanoids, right? You loved the horse so famed in battle, but you made his destiny whip, spur, and lash. Right? So this idea of, wow, horses once used to run free, you loved it, it then became enslaved to humanity, who turned it into this beast to go into war. 
you made his destiny a seven league gallop, right? Like horses used to run free and you destroyed horses' freedom. You loved the shepherd, the grazier, the herdsmen you gave, who gave you piles of loaves baked in embers and slaughtered kids. Um, kids here means baby goats every day. Him you struck and turned into a wolf, right? So you took this person that was trying to protect and you made him be eaten. And he's that thing which he was trying to protect his people from, his, um, his, his livestock. As a result of all of this, though, Ishtar gets really upset, um, as I mentioned, and requests the bull of heaven for revenge. The goddess Ishtar heard these words. She went up to heaven in a furious rage, weeping. She went to Anu, her father, before Antu, her mother, her tears did flow. Oh, father, again and again does Gilgamesh scorn me, telling a tale of foulest slander. Slander about me, and insults too. Anu opened his mouth to speak, saying to Lady Ishtar, ah, but... Was it not you who provoked King Gilgamesh till he told the tale of foulest slander? Slander about you and insults too. Ishtar opened her mouth to speak, saying to her father, Anu, father, please, give me the bull of heaven so in his dwelling I may slay Gilgamesh. This is very much a domestic situation of a young girl feeling slighted and going to her parents and saying, hey, give me this big weapon. They refuse at first, but she blackmails for it. If you do not give me the bull of heaven, I shall smash the gates of the netherworld right down to its dwelling. To the world below, I shall grant manumission. I shall bring up the dead to consume the living. I shall make the dead outnumber the living. She's saying, I will make this world a topsy-turvy place. That which was down will be up. That which was up will be down. I'm going to flip it. Anu opened his mouth to speak, saying to Lady Ishtar, if you want from me the bull of heaven, let the widow of Uruk Gavin gather seven years chaff, and the farmer of Uruk, Uruk grow seven years hay. She agrees, and she says it's happened, um, and we get the boss fight that David was talking about earlier in that tweet. Down came Ishtar, leading it onward, when it reached the land of Uruk, it dried up the woods, the reed beds and marshes down to the, rent, to the river, lowered the level by seven full cubits. So here we have a drought, a drought. As the bull of heaven snorted, a pit opened up. 100 men of Uruk fell down it. The second time it snorted, a pit opened up. 200 men of Uruk fell down it. Here we have earthquakes. The third time it snorted, a pit opened up and Enkidu fell in as far as his waist. Enkidu sprang up and seized the bull by the horns. In his face, the bull spat slaver with the tufts of its tail. So what we have here is a moment where um, kind of we're explaining something historically, we're using myth, we're kind of merging these two things, but it's like, oh, I wonder why sometimes like there's um, earthquakes and droughts that happen at the same time. Maybe there's a being called a be uh, bull of heaven that comes down and has these like massive fights with demigods. This should look really familiar as we encounter the death of the bull of heaven. Enkidu is speaking. My friend, I have tested the bull of heaven, the might of the bull of heaven. So learning its strengths and knowing its purpose, let me test again the might of the bull. I shall get myself behind the bull of heaven. I will seize it by the tuft of the tail. I will set my foot on the back of its legs. Then you, like a butcher, brave and skillful, between the yoke of his horn and the slaughter spot, thrust in your knife. So things to point out here, right? Um, Enkidu uses this metaphor of a butcher. A butcher is a person from civilization, right? Because they take animal, wild animal meat and they transform it into cuts of meat to sell off. So butchery is technology. But also this should remind you of the slaying of Humbaba, this kind of teamwork against the natural and divine worlds. The result of the killing of the bull of heaven is very different for Ishtar and Gilgamesh. On the side of Ishtar, Ishtar assembled the courtesans, the prostitutes and harlots over the bull of heaven's haunch, which is a chunk of leg, thigh. She ran rites of mourning. Gilgamesh summoned all the smiths and craftsmen 
the size of the horns the craftsmen admired. And so here we have these two things. We have the haunch, the meat, and we have the horns, which you can't eat. 30 minas of lapis lazuli in a solid block, two minas each of their rims, six core of oil, the capacity of both. He gave them to his guide, the Gulbanda, to hold oil for anointment. He took them to hang in his chamber. And then Gilgamesh spoke a word to the serving girls of his palace. Who is the finest among men? Who is the most glorious of fellows? Gilgamesh is the finest among men. Gilgamesh is the most glory, glorious of fellows. So what we have here is Ishtar, part of the divine beings, mourning, rites of mourning, the death of the bull. We have Gilgamesh turning that bull into a trophy. Look how big these horns are. I'm so mighty, I'm so tough. I have nothing but contempt for trophy hunters. Moving on to Tablet 7. Tablet 7 is going to feature Enkidu's dream and death, and he opens by dreaming of a god's council. My friend, he wakes up and says, why were the gods in council? And the reason the next part looks different is because this survives from a paraphrase, a Hittite paraphrase. So it's not the cuneiform that we have been reading in translation. Enkidu began to speak to Gilgamesh, my brother, this night, what a dream I dreamed. The gods, Anu, Enlil, Ea, and Celestial Shamash held assembly, and Anu spoke unto Enlil, these, because they slew the bull of heaven, and slew Humbaba that guarded the mountain, dense, wooded with cedar, so said Anu, between these two, let one of them die. And Enlil said, let Enkidu die, but let not Gilgamesh die. Celestial Shamash began to reply to the hero Enlil, was it not at your word they slew him, the bull of heaven, and also Humbaba? Now shall innocent Enkidu die? Enlil was wroth, angry at Celestial Shamash. How like our comrade if you march with them daily. Right, because sun god it goes with the people when they're outside. Enkidu lay down before Gilgamesh, his tears flowed like streams. Oh, my brother, dear to me is my brother. They will never raise me again, up again for my brother. Among the dead I shall sit, the threshold of the dead I shall cross. Never again shall I set eyes on you, my dear brother. So Enkidu is about to go through another liminal phase here. Um, but the thing I want to point to is consequence. We have here the idea of consequence. Because they did this thing, one of them must die. Enkidu then enters a state of delirium. Enkidu lift, and he's going to talk to the door, and it's amazing. Enkidu lifted his eyes as through, as though to the door. He talked with the door as if with a man. Oh, door of the woodland that has no sense. I have understanding that you have not. For 20 leagues I sought for you the finest timber until in the forest I found a tall cedar. Your tree has no rival in the forest of cedar. Six rods to your height, two rods to your breadth, one cubit your thickness. And now he's talking to Enlo, because this is in the temple of Enlo. Had I but known, O oh door, that you could repay me? Had I but known, O oh door, that you would reward me? I would have lifted my axe, I would have cut you down, I would have floated you down as a raft to Eberbara, to Eberbara, the temple of Shamash. I would have brought you, I would have set up the cedar in the gate of Eberbara. In the doorway, I would have stored the thunderbird. Right, so it's basically saying like, man, I gave you door to the wrong person. Like, I gave you to Enlil, Enlil's not saving my life. Should have given you to Shamash. And then the last bit. Now, O door, it was I who fashioned you, who lifted you up. Can I now break you up? Can I now tear you down? May a king who comes after me bear you for, hate, for you hatred or hang you where you cannot be seen. May he remove my name and write upon you his own. This is ultimate. It's like either may you never be seen or I don't want to even be associated with you. And what's the equivalent of erasing your name? It's getting rid of your immortality. We then get this idea of the power of prayer that comes from Gilgamesh. In your presence, I will pray to Anu, father of the gods. May great counselor Enlil hear my prayer in your presence. May my entreaty find favor with Ea. I will fashion your statue in gold without limit. My friend, this is Enkidu. Give no silver, give no gold, give no. The word Enlil spoke is not like the gods. What he commands, he doesn't erase. What he sets down, he doesn't erase. My friend, fixed is my destiny. 
people go to their doom before their time. So this is fatalistic, right? It's like, hey, I'm gonna accept it. This is the thing that's gonna happen. The gods have done this to me. Meanwhile, Gilgamesh is trying to think about this world of statues. And what you should be thinking about is, why statues? What do statues do? And Kadu gets mad though. He's like, you know what? Maybe I don't accept it. I appeal to you, Shamash, for my life so precious. As for the hunter, the trapper man who let me be not as great as my friend, may the hunter be not as great as his friend. Destroy his profit, diminish his income. May his share be cut in your presence. The house where he enters, may its God leave by the window. So he cursed the hunter to his heart's content. Then he decided to curse Shamat the harlot. Come, Shamat, I will fix your destiny, a doom to uh, endure for all eternity. I will curse you with a mighty curse. My curse shall afflict you now and forthwith. A household to lightman you shall not acquire, never to reside in the midst of a family. What's he now saying? He well. This is going to endure for eternity. And what will endure for eternity? No family. Which means she will be eternally uneternal. Eternally uneternal. His curses continue. Right? Because she can't have offspring, that's why. Because you made me weak, who was undefiled. Yes, in the wild, you weakened me, who was undefiled. Some had heard what he had spoken. Straight from the sky, there cried out a voice, Oh, and Kadu! Why curse Shamhat the harlot who fed you bread that was fit for a god, who poured you ale that was fit for a king, who clothed you in a splendid garment and gave you as companion the handsome Gilgamesh. So this voice comes out and reminds Enkidu about the benefits of civilization. And he immediately reverses his stance. And now Gilgamesh, your friend and your brother will lay out for you a magnificent bed on a bed of honor, he will lay you out. He will place you on the left in a seat of repose. The rulers of the underworld will all kiss your feet. The people of Uruk, he will have mourn and lament you. The thriving, so huge funeral. The thriving people, he will fill, fill full of woe for you. After you are gone, his hair will be matted in mourning. Clad in the skin of a lion, he will wander the wild. And Kadu heard the words of Shamash the hero. His heart so angry, grew calm. His heart so furious, grew calm. Come, Shahat, Shamat, I will fix your destiny. My mouth that cursed you shall bless you as well. Governors shall love you and noblemen too. At one league off, men shall slap their thighs. At two leagues off, they shall shake out their hair. No soldier shall be slow to drop his belt for you. Obsidian he shall give you. Lapis lazuli and gold. Earrings and jewelry shall be what he gives you. Right? So he had gone from saying, hey, I curse you to be a, like a street whore, and now he's saying, I, you're gonna be the greatest of the prostitutes and hugely wealthy. He then has a small desire to be remembered as we wrap, reach the end here. I who endured, this is Enkidu, I who endured all hardships with you, remember me, my friend. Don't forget all I went through, right? Tell my story, tell my story, make me immortal. And now he's sick for 12 days. An 11th day and a 12th, Enkidu lay on the bed. He called for Gilgamesh and spoke to his friend. My God is taken against me, my friend. I do not die like one who falls in the midst of battle. I was afraid of combat. And my friend, one who falls in combat makes his name. But I, I do not fall in combat and shall not make my name. So we'll get to this issue of like masculinity and fame, martial fame in the Aeneid. So store this away in your palace of tread mind, your, um, your palace of memory, because it will come back. So at this point, I want to pause briefly and ask, Shamash reminds Enkidu of bread, ale, clothing, friendship, and burial honors. Enkidu then takes back his curse. So in the poem, how does civilization convince us that it's worth it? even while knowing the price is, we will die. So what are the, why, why does civilization say, hey, like knowing that you're going to die is worth it. Here's what we civilization give you. And then we're just going to wrap this up with tablet eight, which is Gilgamesh's lament. At the very first glimmer of the brightening dawn, Gilgamesh began mourning his friend. 
O Enkidu, whom your mother a gazelle and your father a wild donkey did raise, whom the wild asses did rear with their milk, whom the beasts of the wild did teach all the pastures. O Enkidu, may the paths of the forest of cedar mourn you without pause by day and by night. May the elders of teeming Uruk the sheep field mourn you. May the crowd who gave us their blessing mourn you. May the high peaks of hills and mountains mourn you, pure. May the pastures lament like your mother. May boxwood, cypress, and cedar mourn you, through whose midst we crept in our fury. May the bear mourn you, the hyena, the panther, the cheetah, the stag, and the jackal, the lion, the wild bull, the deer, and the ibex, and all the beasts of the wild. May the shepherd boy mourn you, who provided the ghee for your lips. May the brewer mourn you, who provided the ale for your mouth. May the harlot mourn you, who anointed you with sweet-smelling oil. May, in the heart, house of the wedding ceremony, mourn you, who a wife. So what we have here is ritualized mourning. One of the things I want you to think about is what's the relationship between society, civilization, and ritualized mourning? What does ritualized mourning let us do as a civilization? In part of his mourning, one of the things that Gilgamesh does is he's going to reduce himself of these markers of civilization. He covered, like a bride, the face of his friend. Like an eagle, he circled him. Like a lioness deprived of her cubs, he paced to and fro. So notice he's going backwards through these elements of civilization. He goes from marriage to an eagle to now a lioness, right? He's stepping backward like a reverse evolution. His curly hair he tore out in clumps. He ripped off his finery like nothing taboo. He cast it away. At the very glimmer of the brightening dawn, Gilgamesh sent forth a call to the land. So he's putting himself into a performance of wilderness. He's looking more like Enkidu did. And he calls for a statue. Oh, forge master, coppersmith, goldsmith, jeweler, fashion, my friend. He made a statue of his friend. The limbs of my friend shall be. Your eyebrows shall be of lapis lazuli. Your chest of gold, your body shall be of. And then it goes on and on and on with the materials of the statue. And so we'll continue by thinking about the immortality of statues. What do they convey? And at the same time, you should be thinking about Ozymandias. All right, let us go forth into the world and think some thoughts about civilization and the nature of 